Hey, what's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. Normally, this time, we would be having the Bolo Show, but considering there's no new comic book releases right now, we're putting the Bolo Show on standby. We got a brand new video series for you, don't we, Jack? We do. This virus is not going to stop us from keeping moving the channel forward. We know you guys want content and we are listening to you. So like Brian said, we've got a new show, uh, a new list uh, with no new comics. The Bolo list really cannot exist in its current form. So one of the questions I get on a regular basis on social media is, what are you buying? What are you looking for? What are you hunting? Uh, why aren't you doing a top 10 anymore? Yeah. And so here, that's the thing is, um, my buy list is very long. There's a lot of books I'm keeping my eye on and watching trends. And it's all about knowing when is the right time. So it's a perfect opportunity to marry both of those two ideas. We've got a top 10 list for you. It's going to come weekly. And it's going to be the top 10 books this week that I've kind of got my eye on on the back issue market. Yeah, so without further ado, we're going to jump into that right now, counting down the first top 10 back issues to be on the lookout for. Starting with number 10, we have Daredevil number 174. This has a pretty good first appearance in it, doesn't it, Jack? Yeah, it's the first appearance of The Hand. If you're, if you're at all familiar with Frank Miller's Daredevil run, or if you watch the Netflix series, which did a really great job depicting The Hand, um, then you're familiar with this uh, essentially clan. And uh, it, it's really an, an essential part of the Daredevil mythos. And we know a few things right now. Um, we know that at some point we're going to get into sort of these – Asian stories where the hand is undoubtedly going to play a major role. Um, we also know that there's strong rumors of Daredevil popping up in the MCU soon, uh, most likely played by Charlie Cox, whether it's the Spider-Man movie um, or some other guest appearance. We know that's coming within the next couple of years. Yeah, not to mention it's like right in the middle of Frank Miller's badass Daredevil run. Then at number nine this week, we have Watchmen number one. Now, this is a book that you should always be looking out for, especially if you find it cheap prices. It's classic storytelling. Probably one of the most, a lot of people call it like the most perfect storytelling. But either way, Watchmen number nine, Jack, why is this on the list? Well, yeah, very different reasons than Daredevil. Daredevil is extremely cheap, good possible high ROI. With Watchmen, you're looking at more of a blue chip book. Just like you said, Brian, you're looking at one of the greatest stories of all time. Now, the HBO series really reinvigorated Watchmen sales. We saw Watchmen number one trading for about $75, 60 to 75 consistently. That has dropped down to 20, 25, 30 in real high grade with some sales in the teens. The thing about that is, just because the creator of the show has stepped off the show doesn't mean HBO is necessarily going to turn their back on Watchmen content. We know that with HBO Max, there's going to be more DC Comics content. So whether they continue that story or they go to some other story within the Watchmen universe, proof of concept is there with HBO that they can do a Watchmen series and people will like it and people will watch it. Also, regardless of that, even if they never do another TV show or movie, what you said, Brian, is really true. This book is a classic. It is a major, major key. And anytime this book dips down low in affor into affordability, it's one to be on the lookout for because this book is going to have its moments from time to time. And you want to have this book at a low point. So if you're looking to offload it, you can offload it at that high point. But this is a keeper. It should be in every PC. Yeah, this is definitely a collector's book because anyone that wants to read that fantastic story usually picks up the trade. But if you want that issue number one, definitely pick it up and you find it at an affordable price. Coming in at number eight, we get a little bit of a twofer here and we have Fantastic Four number 204 and number 205. These I was picking up a while back, especially when Guardians of the Galaxy was first coming around and we had talk about the Nova Corps. But Jack, explain these books a little bit more for our viewers. Well, yeah, first appearance of the Nova Corps, the Nova Corps being um, the military force that, of course, Nova is a part of. Um, we've seen them in, in, in the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movie, uh, and then they kind of went away, and that is a benefit right now to comic buyers because 
we know that eventually Nova is coming to the MCU. We know you cannot tell Nova's story without really going heavy into the Nova Corps. And for people who are mad that like the Nova Corps may not have got enough shine in Guardians of the Galaxy, I really think that that is the reason why. I think they wanted us to be introduced to it, uh, but we're not going to get the full picture until we get Nova. Otherwise, there would have possibly been some retreading to that story. Either way, these issues, we're talking three, four, five dollars on a regular basis, Brian. These are my favorite back issue bin books. I cannot tell you how many fantastic four, like dollar or two dollar boxes at conventions I pull these issues out of. People do not treat these issues like key issues. I think that they are major, major keys. Um, after the Nova number one issue, to me, the next most important books in the Nova mythos are these two. And the reason there's two of them is it's a whole cameo, first full appearance thing. You know, I hate that debate. Either way, buy them both, put them together, sell them as a lot. Yeah, I've been picking up 205 more than I have 204. And I agree, just like you, outside of Nova number one, really within that Nova series, it's you get, uh, some great villain keys, but this one lines up directly with that, with that Nova core. Then coming in at number seven, we get another twofer. And also, these are books that aren't strangers to this channel. We've talked about them multiple times. But we're talking about Go-Go Power Rangers number eight and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number nine, two key character first appearances that are actually very relevant in the current Power Rangers storyline. Right, Jack? That's right. These books have been heating up over the last couple of months. But... This virus has created opportunities in the comic market, and we're starting to see the beginnings of a dip. I don't know if it's a strong buy right now because you're seeing so many outliers. I see one first Draken sell for $8. I see the next one sell for 30 So it's very hard to judge. I'm all over it under $10. Bucks. Um, 30 I certainly don't want to be buying. Same can be said for Gogo Power Rangers number eight, the first appearance of the Ranger Slayer, which is a even tougher to find book. At this point, I'm also really paying attention to the variants, the unlocked variant. And for, the second print. Yeah, the well, second print, absolutely. Those, those Montez books, the, the second print, big time money. But the, the unlocked variant um, for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number nine is very tough, black cover. Uh, it's not very common. And Either way, all of these books you're going to start seeing over the next couple months because they were so publisher driven, as you mentioned, the reason why these are heating up. We, we're not seeing these characters in a movie. Um, we're seeing the beginnings of toys as uh, Ranger Slayer's first action figure debuted at this year's Toy Fest and Draken has had some convention exclusives and a lightning series action figure that did extremely well. Um, as well as a Funko Pop that was a PX exclusive that also did extremely well. Uh, you know, these characters have yet to like fully mature to where they can be, but in every facet that they've been introduced to, they've done extremely well. Then heading our list at number six this week, we get Green Lantern Corps number 201. That's got the first appearance of Kilowog, right? Right, Kilowog and several other of the kind of like animalistic members. Yeah, of I was going to say Lantern there's a couple Corps. minor key uh, first appearances as well, right? Yeah, the, these characters are all kind of like Kilowog is is a I'd say a main supporting character, but the rest of them they, they're typically smaller. But they're possible show stealers because you got characters who could very well be the DC universe's answer to say Rocket Raccoon or something like that. Um, again, we know this HBO Max series is coming and. At this portion of the list, we're going to start getting very heavy Green Lantern because this HBO Mag series is heavy on my mind. We saw, if you watch the CW, if you're really following all of the various extended DC Universe stuff, you saw that teaser, that little Green Lantern scene that, that's supposed to be part of that HBO Max. So we know we're getting the Green Lantern Corps. Uh, there, there was a multitude of lanterns. So we're going to get the Green Lantern Corps. Um, there's been some heavy Hollywood rumors that we're going to get Sinestro Corps. Um, and so we have an idea of the storyline we're going to get into. This book is going to be a key. Um, there's, I, I would bank on Kilowog, but if not Kilowog, one of these other characters is the type of character that has a chance to connect in pop culture, uh, the way Rocket Raccoon has, the way Groot has, the way uh, the Porg did, or the child, AKA Baby Yoda. Um, that these characters have that chance. This book is still affordable for such a key for so many years. Um, just be on the lookout for those cheap copies, uh, but it's also a tough book, so be on the lookout for 
BFing up because this is a white cover. There's a lot of scuffing. Also, uh, change up your searches when you're looking for it because some people list them under different names for different searches. It, it's, it, it's just random. <laughs> then Jack mentioned Sinestro Corps, and we have the first appearance of the Sinestro Corps coming at number five this week with Green Lantern number 10. This is also important to know that this is the 2005 series, right, Jack? Right. This is that Jeff John series um, when he first – took the helm in Green uh, Lantern, the first volume of his two volumes that he really, it, epic story, Brian, I know you both, you and I are big fans of, but you know, I mentioned before, there's, there's strong rumors of Sinestro Corps being a part of the uh, DC Max show. And I'm not big on like rumored speculation. I'm really not gonna spend heavy money on books just for that reason. But the reason why I feel safe about this book is the same reason why I talked about Watchmen to a lesser degree. Uh, the Sinestro Court is an important part of the Green Lantern mythos at this point in the modern storytelling, modern comics. So no matter where Green Lantern goes, it's inevitable, if not in the immediate future, in the distant future, we will see some version of this play out um, in, in, in TV or movies. It was definitely going to go there with the original Ryan Reynolds movie. And there was a long standing kind of debate what issue was the first appearance. This seems to be the one that um, most online sources have really landed on. Seems like this is the one Jeff Johns has tabbed as the first appearance. So um, this book is still available out there. It's still cheap. It's still in bins. It's still a cover price book. A lot of places it has yet to really get the attention um, that it probably deserves. So be on the lookout for this one. Also, I'll go ahead and let you know that the volume one Green Lantern number 10, this, that Silver Age book, it's actually the origin of the Green Lantern Oath. When I first had this list, I thought that's what Jack was talking about, and he corrected me. So we got two great books there. You got that number 10 from Silver Age with the origin of the Oath, and then the first appearance of Sinestro Corps and the 2005 number 10. Then coming in at number four, we're talking about that Green Lantern 2005 series again. This is probably my favorite book of that run. We're talking about Green Lantern number 25. This is the guy with the regular cover. There's also a great one in 10 incentive Gary Frank variant for this. But why is this one so important, Jack? Well, you're talking about multiple first appearances. First appearance of Atrocitus, first appearance of Lar Fleas, first appearance of the Red Lanterns. Um, these are all really essential characters and elements within the Green Lantern mythos. And again, for all of the reasons I've already highlighted, um, these books are a dwindling window of opportunity to purchase before we're going to start seeing um, them show up in other media. And, you know, we're going to see them show up in media that I think feels a little bit more bankable than others. HBO has delivered. I mean, th what, what they did with Watchmen, um, what they've done on a regular basis with their Sunday programming for the last God knows how many years. Um, it, it feels like a solid play to, to see this be successful. Um, Atrocitus was originally a character who was um, attached to the Green Lantern movie to possibly be the big villain. Um, we've mentioned Sinestro Corps, which would make Sinestro probably the big villain for the show. Uh, so this may not be an immediate payoff but it, like i said there's a limited time to get these books this is a a really a major major key in the book that's been popular with speculators for a long time so limited opportunity to buy this book before it really blows up and the best thing about this book is the multiple first appearances lar fleas has a cult following the red lanterns are important there's a lot of chance for this book to take off yeah, we talk a lot a bit about that buying cycle, and this is one of those books that always goes up and comes down. It gets his attention, it gets hot for a minute, and then it drops back down. Uh, that one in 10, that one's usually always harder to find, and a lot of people are aware of it, so uh, be on the lookout for it, but it's going to be a little bit more money. Then number three on the list this week, we got Eternals number three. Now, recently we talked about Eternals being on the down portion on our three up, three down video. That's a good reason why these are on this list. Eternals number three, what's that? The first appearance of Cersei, right? Yeah, that's right, Brian. And there's no doubt we talked about it on three up, three down. Um, Eternals is a great buying opportunity. And I like that buying opportunity so much. If you've seen this list in its entirety, you know where Eternals is represented on this list. And this is volume one. This is the top of my brain right now. Um, and it's just reality. Eternals, I really am bullish on being a, a big movie. 
you've got the star power, uh, you've got the director, you've got everything put together. It's a cosmic story. And people are like, well, Eternals has never been a popular comic. Well, neither was Guardians of the Galaxy. And the reality is, I think that that plays to their benefit, it allows them to tell any story they want without getting nitpicked by diehard comic readers who want to see the story that they want to see. Circe is being played by Angelina Jolie. She is an, a certified A-list actress. Uh, when this was confirmed, these books shot up. We were seeing sales as high as 100, pushing towards 150. I'm seeing mid-grade, six, seven, un, ungraded um, books selling for in the 12 to 15 to 18 range right now. Um, I'm seeing regular VF sales in the 20s. This is a temporary crash. This book is going to come back to the prices that it was at. So get it before it rebounds. Yeah, just like you mentioned about Guardians of the Galaxy, no one outside of that 2008 number one book, you saw all those books take off and everyone was still like not knowing what to expect. And now Guardians of the Galaxy is a household name. Not only that, but they have a ride in Disney World. They replaced Tower of Terror out there with the Guardians of the Galaxy ride. They got a ride they're building in Epcot, which is the Guardians of the Galaxy roller coaster. So if they can do the same with, from Guardians of the Galaxy with Eternals, I'm definitely all in on buying some of these books, especially at the price point that we're seeing them right now. Yep. Then at the second to top spot this week, we get another Eternals book and Eternals number 11, Jack. Yeah, and this one I really think provides the largest ROI possible. So because- cheap right now. Yeah, so cheap and really never took off to the to the lengths that um, other books have. And here you're getting a book with a, a really an actor tied to it um, that is red hot at the moment. It may not be to, like, to the level of Angelina Jolie, but Angelina Jolie is, to put it nicely, maybe an aging star, uh, is maybe not in her absolute prime of her career. Um, versus Kumal who's kind of coming into his his prime coming off of the uh the HBO series Silicon Valley uh the Amazon movie The Big Sick and then really going viral famous getting an incredible shape for this film um this being the first appearance of his character um a kind of like shogun almost like racist character uh you know and to see how they're going to interpret that and make that kind of character more um playable within a disney franchise um i really think that that bodes well for him because i think it's going to allow him to make this character what he wants to make it and he's been popular and a, and a show stealer and everything he's been in so the fact that this book is so cheap as you mentioned brian and the possibilities of there's such a big cast. We don't know who's going to be like the, the show stealer of this movie. I think there's, this is a good chance. This is a great book to get. And it's out there and it's cheap. And topping our list this week at the number one spot, sticking with the Eternals, we get Eternals number one. This is the big issue that most people are well aware of, right? Right. And now there's a lot of debate about like what Eternals issue would you say is the most important? Um, you know, when you look at Guardians of the Galaxy as a comparison, people really gravitate towards this specific character. So the first appearance of Star-Lord, the first appearance of Rocket Raccoon, first appearance of Groot, first appearance of Gamora, all tend to do better than those old classic Guardians of the Galaxy issues. But having said that, I really think this is going to be a, a, a different situation because we have a clear-cut defined first appearance it's a first appearance in the Bronze Age. It's attainable. Um, and it's mostly the people of the team that they're using in the movie. In the movie, exactly. And while it's not Cersei's first appearance, um, as we just mentioned, uh, you know, with issue number 11, there's other characters. Uh, another popular character is the actor from Atlanta, who's, I think, his character that he's going to play. The first appearance is in, like, the second volume, number yeah. three. So and the guy from Silicon Valley. Right, so there's there's a lot of different um, different characters who are going to appear in later issues after number one, but number one is the first appearance of the Eternals, the team. Um, it's 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 going to be as the Eternals movie gets ready for marketing. It's going to be the book you see in a lot of um, 
news stories and imaging, I expect there to be a lot of discussion about Jack Kirby. Uh, I think this is a classic book. This is and the best part about this is Brian. We've already seen what this book can can get to. The thing about these books is they don't feel like risky buys because you can look and see at just the D23 stuff, just seeing these actors on stage. We already know what the price is that those books got driven up to. If you buy them now, just getting back up to where they were at D23, you would make a great ROI. That's how affordable these keys are. Um, Eternals number one is selling for anywhere from about 40 to $60. Uh, there's some higher grade options. There's some lower grade options. So you can go either way with it, but you can get a nice copy for 40 to $60 right now. And, you know, we've already seen prices of 150 on this book. I sold way too many copies of this book for between 100 and 150. So I really think that getting back to there is going to be nothing. And once a trailer comes out or the film comes out, or if it's a successful and ends up being a multi-film franchise like everything marvel does um uh, sky's the limit with this book yeah so another thing like he was talking about you can go on ebay sold listings kind of look at what the trend's been doing or also good friends of ours check out cover price c-o-v-r-p-r-i-c-e.com they have uh you can sign up there and they have a larger sales history where you can see what that trend's doing for these books so you can kind of gauge where you're at where with where that slope is where how far down it's come if it's rising back up Either way, all great opportunities, all great books on this list. Again, this is just our opinion, right, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. These are some, and only some, I tell you, because we're going to be back next week with 10 more. Some of the books that we're looking at right now is great buying opportunities in the back issue market uh, to get yourself ready for comics to get back to normal. Yep. So there it is, guys. Always remember, buy what you like. That way you end up with the books that you want. This is Brian Jack with Superman's Comics. We will see you next week on another Top 10 Buy List.